Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! It's coming up to midday here. Let's take a look at Big Ben. Prime Minister's questions only a few minutes away there, three minutes to 12. But Laura Kunzberg is already here. Welcome back. Um, there is an interesting difference in emphasis. The, the European leaders are still kind of almost in a state of shock mm -hmm. about Mr. Trump's victory, calling a special meeting of foreign ministers, to which our foreign minister and the French foreign minister did not go. Mm -hmm. The mood I sense in Britain, in the government, is more, all right, we didn't expect this, but there could be some opportunities for us here. Yeah, I think there's no question about that. I think they're taking a more pragmatic line. I mean, certainly they were shocked by the victory, but they're absolutely taking a more pragmatic line. And one of the really interesting things that's happened this week that didn't perhaps get as much attention as it might have done was Theresa May's speech at the Lord Mayor's banquet on Monday night, where, in fact, she agrees with much of Donald Trump's analysis of what has happened in the last 10 or 20 years with the left behind. It's a rather unfortunate mm. phrase, but the left behind. People for whom the rising tide's boats did absolutely not lift. Now, it's worth saying that Theresa May sort of made that argument on the steps of number 10 and then again in her conference speech. But to make it again just a couple of days after Donald Trump's victory is an extremely different context. And also to make that argument again and warn people who were liberals that if they didn't listen harder to voters that they might lose again and they might in fact be enemies of liberalism, which is a phrase that she used, I think was quite a statement. And some Tory MPs I've spoken to have actually been slightly uncomfortable about her making that sort of enemies of liberalism, liberalism mm -hmm. accusation. But also I understand at Cabinet yesterday there was a long and quite thoughtful, I'm told, discussion of actually what the Trump victory means, what the Brexit vote means in the context of whether or not the, the settlement, if you like, of the last few decades is over. And maybe if it's not over, it's certainly very frayed at the edges. Well, one of the things I was told very strongly in the British government is that they will now, mm. in the Brexit negotiations, they will now make geopolitics m much more part of that. They are going to say, at a time when there's an American president that has attacked NATO, that we are not sure we can count on for the defence of Europe, why would you beat up on Europe's biggest military power mm -hmm. with the only world-class nuclear deterrent mm -hmm. and with quick deployable forces which are already on the eastern mm -hmm. border? And that will cut through in Berlin above all. It absolutely will. And one cabinet minister said to me yesterday they believe the Trump victory absolutely strengthens the UK's hand in the Brexit negotiations for two reasons. One, just as you outline, over security. Why on earth would you want to start being hostile towards a country that still has a significant um, sort of standing in the world in terms of its defence capabilities, as we do, particularly important for the Eastern Europeans? And second of all, that Donald Trump has made plain as a Brexit supporter that he is more interested in the potential of a trade deal mm. with Britain in some way, shape or form. And we'll see what role Newt Gingrich ends up with. But he previously has made this suggestion of having a deal between the um, expanding NAFTA. So the deal between the states um, and uh, Mexico, Canada and the UK could somehow go into a sort of Anglophile sort of free trading agreement. So on you mean the Mexicans will front... have to speak English? <laughs> <laughs> I, think I think they will need to be consulted on this. this. And build the wall. Yeah, well, and, anyway. and build a wall yeah. or a fence or whatever. Which yeah. That's something that's already the walls become a fence and maybe it becomes a, I don't know, a pile of pile of bricks by the end of the week. But, you know, certainly on those two fronts, I think the British government spies that there are opportunities. And while Theresa, Theresa May and Donald Trump are, could hardly be more different political creatures, mm -hmm. she's a pragmatist. And he, maybe even Donald Trump, will feel that he needs friends as he starts to navigate this. And maybe Britain will be able to go back to its more traditional role of being a bridge between the rest of Europe and North America. Because for Britain, that's when it's worked, the, the special relationship. It's worked when Britain has been a bridge, not perhaps not too close to America and not too close mm. to Europe and been sort of fo facing both ways. Downing Street are also, you know, spelling out the possibility that they may be able to meet before the inauguration. Now, that's only happened a couple of times when a president-elect has met the British mm. Prime Minister. And I think, you know, after that sort of most memorable of Kodak moments of the two cheesy grins in front of the gold lift in Nigel Trump Farage Tower. Nigel and Donald Trump. Uh, which, of course, is nothing that Number 10 could do anything about. Sure. 
but it was certainly unfortunate choreography. I think they would be keen to uh, get a visit in rather sharpish. I uh, spoke to a number of people at the weekend in New York, mm. close to the Trump transition team, mm. and they w were fascinating. I mean, whether it all happens is entirely another matter because yeah. it is a bit chaotic, but Bill Clinton's transition was chaotic as well uh, uh, in uh, 1992, his first, uh, the, when, when he took over from Mr. Bush. I have to finish that point later, but it's important, but not as important as PMPs. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm sure that the whole House will join me in expressing our condolences to the families and friends of the seven people who lost their lives and those who were injured in the tragic tram incident in Croydon last Wednesday. And we will all want to thank those involved in the rescue operation. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Lindy Morton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Would the Prime Minister join me in welcoming today's news that the unemployment rate has fallen yeah. to yeah. She joined me in thanking all those businesses who create jobs, businesses such as Jennifer Ash and Sons, whose funeral home I was kindly asked to open in my constituency on the Brown Hills High Street last weekend. Well, I absolutely agree with my honourable friend, and I'm pleased to say that in the last year, uh, employment in her constituency of Aldridge Brown Hills has gone up by 88,000. And it's good to hear of companies that are all, uh, opening new jobs, as she's, uh, as she's indicated. The employment figures show the strength of the fundamentals of our economy, with employment rate never been higher, the unemployment rate the lowest uh, than it has been in more than a decade. And I'm sure that members on all sides of this House will also want to welcome yesterday's news from Google that they will be creating another 3,000 jobs. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I concur with the remarks the Prime Minister just made about the disaster in Croydon last week? Our sympathies to all those who lost loved ones and our solidarity with the emergency workers who have gone through such trauma in freeing people from the wreckage. Mr Speaker, it appears from press reports that the Chagos Islanders, who were expelled from their homes over 40 years ago, are going to suffer another injustice today, today with their denial of their right of return. Yesterday, the Foreign Secretary told European media that Brexit would probably mean leaving the customs union. Can the Prime Minister confirm whether this is the case? I think the Right Honourable Gentleman is trying to get two issues in there. Uh, can I just say, on the issue of the Chagos Islanders, there will be a written ministerial statement that will be uh, in the House later today, so everybody will be able to see the position that the Government is taking on that particular issue. On the whole question of the customs union, of the trading relationships that we have with uh, the European Union and with other parts of the world once we have left the European Union, uh, we are preparing carefully for the formal negotiations. But We are preparing carefully for the formal negotiations. What we want to ensure is that we have the best possible trading deal with the European Union once we have left. Yes, uh, Jeremy Corbyn doesn't like uh, to bring up Brexit at Prime Minister's questions, but given that Boris Johnson, our illustrious Foreign Secretary, has suggested that Britain is likely to leave the customs union, uh, Mr Corbyn decided not to, de not to duck uh, the debate this week. That opening gambit from uh, the Labour leader. Now, of course, the customs union is different, James, to the single market. It affects goods coming into the EU. So, in effect, importers only pay a tariff once the product has entered the union, which also includes uh, Turkey. So, let's say you take a shipment of uh, tablets from the Far East at Folkestone. There will only be one import tariff, and then they can be distributed uh, throughout the union uh, without being taxed any further. Boris yesterday, of course, told a Czech newspaper that we might have to abandon that union to get what we want. Theresa May... She was asked about it, as you just heard there, and she refused to rule out uh, the fact that she disagreed with the Foreign Secretary. Now, all the PM not, not the best possible trading deal, is it? No, it's... It's, <laughs> it's the, it's the le le the least bad trading deal. Yeah. It, all the Prime Minister had to say was that, you, that the UK would not leave uh, the customs union, but she couldn't set. Number 10 are actually quite relaxed about the Boris interview yesterday because, of course, uh, Boris Johnson also dismissed uh, the idea that the free movement of Labour was one of the four founding principles of the EU. He said the notion, and I'm just changing the phrase slightly, uh, was baloney. That's an idea 
uh, that Downing Street wants to take hold, because if that happens... It's not true, though. It's in the Treaty of Rome. It's Article, it's 3, Article 3. It's Article 3, yes. But they want to chip away... At the truth. ...at that idea, because then it will be easier to remain within the single market if you can just tweak one of the areas, one of the four founding principles, rather than just saying it's... It's there, and, and, and there isn't it. a single European politician yet who said that there's any hope of that happening. Well, Angela Merkel said she's happy to discuss the I- idea about free around free movement uh, further, but no, she hasn't. With she, she, specific reference missing from the British newspaper coverage today to the idea of people coming to a country, working for a short period of time, and then claiming benefits for the rest of their life. That's been removed completely from a lot of the coverage and a lot of the that, copy. That's limited. That partly it is limited. because it already happens in Germany and Belgium and other countries. They've already got that in place, and we could have had it in place. Well. Exactly, because oh, what, what, what happened? Anyway, what happened? Yeah, 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 we're, we're, we're doing truth. We need to go back to post truth. It's a wonderful breakthrough for Merkel, according to the front page of the Daily Telegraph. Uh, Mr. Corbyn then turned his attention to yesterday's memo from the accountants Deloitte. It claimed there were divisions uh, within the cabinet. It also estimated. Whitehall would need to recruit up to 30,000 civil servants to handle uh, the negotiations. Enemy Corbyn! I asked the Prime Minister actually about the Foreign Secretary's remarks about leaving the Customs Union. He's only a few places down from there. Mr Speaker, would he be in order for the Foreign Secretary to come forward and tell us what he actually said? I'm, I'm sure we would all be better informed if he did. Um, earlier this week, uh, Mr. Speaker, a leaked memo said the government is the government is considerably said the government is considerably short of having a plan for Brexit. No common strategy has emerged, in part because of the divisions within the cabinet. <coughs> If this memo is, as the Prime Minister's press department says, written by ill-informed consultants, could she put the government's plan and common strategy for Brexit before Parliament? I have to say to the right honourable gentleman, yes, we do have a plan. is to deliver the best possible deal in trading with and operating with the European Union. Our plan is to deliver control of movement from people from the European Union into the United Kingdom. Our plan is to go out there across the world and negotiate tra- free trade agreements around the rest of the world. And, and this government is absolutely united in its determination to deliver in its determination to deliver on the will of the British people and to deliver Brexit. His shadow cabinet can't even decide whether it supports Brexit or not. It's a punch and Judy, aren't we? I think I actually preferred him when he was getting all his questions off Doris in Ongar. Well, we all thought he did quite well. I thought he did quite well uh, today because at least he had six questions. I mean, there was a little interlude at the very beginning about the Chagos Islands, uh, but uh, he he did six questions on Brexit and he brought up that memo because number 10 were infuriated by what the Times published. And this was a memo, it was a pitch for work uh, from Deloitte. Uh, they say it was done without any, um, without any inside knowledge about what was really going on within uh, Parliament. It does seem to have come from Whitehall, I think, i.e. that the pitch has gone into the Cabinet Office and then spat itself out into the Times newspaper. But the Times really getting cross with, uh, the Downing Street really getting cross with the Times and really getting cross with the BBC mm. uh, about it as well. Uh, Mrs May, in her response, Again, she refused to rule out this idea about the customs union. Uh, Theresa May picking up on uh, some comments yesterday by John Macdonald, the Shadow Mm. Chancellor, who said that Brexit uh, presented an enormous opportunity. Labour, as things uh, stand, James, it does not plan to block uh, Mrs May's proposed deal if it does come down to a parliamentary vote uh, before Article 50 is triggered at the end of March. And that's important because of what we saw with the High Court decision, and if that's upheld by the Supreme Court, it doesn't actually become irrelevant, because if Labour's going to support it, uh, then of course it will sail through uh, Parliament. Jeremy Corbyn ignored the criticism. He ploughed on with the idea that the government doesn't know what it's doing, quoting Italy's uh, Economic Development Minister Carlo Calenda. Jeremy Corbyn! Well, the word doesn't seem to have travelled very far, Mr Speaker, and I have to say I sympathise with the Italian government minister this week who said about her government, somebody needs to tell us something, it needs to be something that makes sense. 
isn't the truth that the government is making a total shambles of Brexit and nobody understands what her strategy actually is? Of course, of course, uh, those in the European Union who we will be negotiating with will want us to set out at this stage every detail of our negotiating strategy. If we were to do that, if we were to do that, it would be the best possible way of ensuring that we got the worst result for this country. That's why we won't do it. Jeremy Corbyn. Well, talking of, of worst results, Mr. Speaker, the Foreign Secretary has been very helpful on this this week because he informed the world that Brexit means Brexit. We didn't know that before. And that beyond that, we're going to make a titanic success of it. <laughs> Mr Speaker, taking back control, if that is what Brexit is to mean, taking back control, she's getting advice from the Foreign Secretary now. Can we all hear it? Yes. Um, Taking back control, Mr Speaker, clearly requires some extra administration. Deloitte obviously spoke and saying that one department estimates it needs a 40% increase in staff to cope with its Brexit projections, and overall expectations are of an increased headcount of between 10 and 30,000 civil servants. If that estimate is wrong, can the Prime Minister tell the House exactly how many extra civil servants will be required to conduct these negotiations? Her ministers need to know. They are desperate for an answer from her. Well, I, say, I, say, I repeat for the right honourable gentleman, we are doing the preparations necessary for the point at which we will start the complex formal negotiations with the European Union. What I have done is set up a department for exiting the European Union, and my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, the member for Horton Price and Howden, is doing an excellent job there in, in, in making those preparations. But I have to say to the right honourable gentleman, from the confusion that he's got on his benches in relation to this issue of Brexit, it's yet another example with, with Labour, where they talk, we act, they posture, we deliver. We're getting on with the job, he's not up to the job. Well, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, my... Well, that was exciting, wasn't it? Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker... Order, far too much noise in the chamber. I say to the honourable gentleman member for Kingston and Surbiton, calm yourself, man. You should seek to imitate the calm and repose of your right honourable and learned friend, the member for Rushcliffe, who's setting an example to all members of the House. Mr. Jeremy Corbyn. I, I don't wish to promote any further divisions on their benches, Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, these are, these are the most complex set of negotiations ever undertaken by this country. The civil service has been cut down to its lowest level since the Second World War. The Prime Minister's main focus ought to be, surely, coming up with a serious plan. But can I ask her to clarify something? When the Supreme Court meets in the beginning of December, if it decides to uphold the decision of the High Court, will the Lord Chancellor this time defend our independent judiciary against any public attacks? As the Right Honourable Gentleman, as the right honourable gentleman knows, there have been two cases in UK courts in relation to the prerogative power and the use of the prerogative power. The Northern Ireland courts found in favour of the Government, the High Court found against the Government. We are appealing to the Supreme Court. We have a good argument, and we will put that case to the Supreme Court. We believe, I believe, this government believes in the independence of our judiciary, and the judiciary will consider that decision and come to their judgment on the basis of the arguments put before them. But we also believe that our democracy is also underpinned by the freedom of our press. Jeremy Corbyn was of defending the independence of the judiciary, we all should be doing that. Mr Speaker, we have an, an International Development Secretary who is opposed to overseas aid. We have a Health Secretary who is running down our National Health Service. We have a Chancellor with no fiscal strategy. 
We have a Lord Chancellor who seems to have difficulty defending the judiciary. We have a Brexit team with no plan for Brexit, and as has just been shown, we have a Prime Minister who is not prepared to answer questions on what the actual Brexit strategy is. We need a better answer than she's given us. tell the right honourable gentleman what we've got. We've got an international development secretary delivering on this government's commitment to spend 0.7% of GNI on international development. We've got a health secretary delivering on £10 billion extra funding for the health service. And we've got a Chancellor of the Exchequer making sure we have the stable economy that creates the wealth necessary to pay for our public services. But what we certainly have got is the leader of the opposition who's incapable of leading. I thought he had I thought he had a better one. He had six questions. I mean you can see from that. The wrong calendar quote. Uh, which was the right one, James? I should defer. Should have gone with this. Um, they're talking to Boris Johnson uh, in a recent meeting. Italy would grant Britain access to the EU's single market. Boris said, "Because you don't want to lose Prosecco expert, uh, exports." Mr. Calenda said, um, uh, "He basically said, I don't want free movement of people, but I want the single market.'" I said, "No way." He said, "You'll sell less Prosecco." I said, "Okay, you'll sell less fish and chips, but I'll sell less Prosecco to one, one country, country, and yeah. you'll sell less to 27." Do you know why he didn't pick that? No, go on. Because he wants hard Brexit. Do you know why he wants hard Brexit? Because he wants to curtail, uh, he wants to curtail goods and, uh, not goods and services, free movement to labour. No, because he wants to get rid of a European Union rules on what a government can do to support industry in a country. He wants to renationalise it. It's yep. his communist state aid dream. And that's why Theresa May was utterly untroubled by what was an otherwise better than average performance by Jeremy Corbyn. It was a better than average performance. Jeremy Corbyn has picked the issue. She's developed the split. Jeremy Corbyn tried to stick to this idea that the government doesn't know what it's doing. Good man, Theo Ashwood. Always a pleasure. The, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister understands that we are a one-nation party or we are nothing, something our political opponents something our political opponents consistently underestimate to their cost. With the autumn statement next week, will she continue to pursue this agenda with all the resource and vigour she can muster, and that including increasing significantly further the personal allowance so the lower paid disproportionately benefit? Yeah. Well, can I... It's always interesting to hear the thoughts of the Honourable Lady, the member for Slough, but they should not be articulated from a sedentary position, and they will have to wait for another occasion. We're grateful. The Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Before I answer my Honourable Friend's question, may I wish his wife all the very best in the treatment that she is going through at the moment. I'm, the thoughts of the House are with her. Uh, and he's right. We ha actually have a manifesto commitment to uh, increasing the personal allowance, yep. and that means that what we've done already by increasing the personal allowance from the 6475 in 2010 11 to 11,000 in 2016 17, and 11,500 next year, we've cut income tax for over 30 million people, and we have taken 4 million people out That's of paying right. income tax altogether. That's important. That has helped people at the lower end of the income scale. Yeah. Angus Robertson. Yeah. Speaker, we join the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition in extending our condolences following the tragedy in Croydon and paying tribute to the emergency services. Mr Speaker, the Institute for Government, which has close ties to the civil service, has published a report. It says that the UK Government's approach towards Brexit is, and I quote, chaotic and dysfunctional, that Brexit poses an existential threat to operations in Whitehall departments, yes. that the Prime Minister has a secretive approach towards Brexit, and that the present situation is unsustainable. Yep. Does the Prime Minister plan to carry on like this regardless? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The right honourable gentleman will not be surprised when I tell him what the government is doing in relation to Brexit. As I said earlier, the, what, the most important thing for this government to do is actually calmly and carefully get on with the job of preparing for complex negotiations. And the most important, one of the most important things we can do is make sure that we're not giving a running commentary on those negotiations and on our stance, because that would be the, worst, the best way to get the worst deal for this country. Angus 
Robertson. Uh, on the day that we hear that post-truth has become the international word uh, of the year, we have a running commentary from the Foreign Secretary. He is prepared to tell the media in the Czech Republic that the United Kingdom is likely to leave the EU customs unit post-Brexit, uh, but still wants to trade freely afterwards. In response, his colleague uh, from the Netherlands has said that that option doesn't exist and is impossible. Both of these things cannot be correct. So will yeah, yeah. the Prime Minister confirm today to the Parliament, to the country, whether the UK is likely to leave the EU customs union post-Brexit, yes, yes or no? Yeah. Yeah. The right honourable gentleman doesn't actually seem to understand that the customs union is not just a binary decision. But let's set that to one side. Let's look at what we need to do, which is to get the best possible deal for access to, for trading with and operating within the single European market. And the right honourable gentleman stands up time and again in Prime Minister's question and says to me, and says to me that he wants, he wants access to the single European market. I might remind him that it was only a couple of years ago that he wanted to take Scotland out of the single European market by making it Mr. Doherty Hughes, you're in a very emotional condition. I normally regard you as a cerebral denizen of the House. Try to recover your composure, man. James Dudridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In South End, crimes uh, such as burglary and vehicle theft are down, but knife crime is on the increase, particularly perpetrated by drug dealers and drug users. Can my right hon. friend confirm this will be a priority? For Her Majesty's Government, and specifically, is there anything more uh, my right honourable friend can do to help police crime commissioners such as Roger Hurst in dealing with this very big challenge? Well, uh, I thank my honourable friend for raising an issue that is very important for everybody in this House. Uh, certainly, the government will do all it can, it can to support police and crime commissioners like Roger Hurst, who is doing, already doing an excellent job in Essex. We have seen overall cri uh, knife crime figures falling since 2009. Uh, but I recognise the concerns my honourable friend has shown. That is why the Home Office has been supporting police forces such as Essex in conducting weeks of action against knives under Operation Sceptre, and we have legislated to ban dangerous knives, including uh, the zombie knives. We are putting tough sentences in, in place, and we are making sure that offenders are punished. We should send a very clear message. We will not tolerate knife crime in this country. Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, um, Many people in this country visit the United States every year to study on business or simply to enjoy one of the greatest countries on earth. Can I ask her what action she would take if the new president-elect carries through on his campaign promise to discriminate against our citizens on the basis of their religion? And will she give a commitment that the special relationship that she believes her government has with the US presidency will be conducted on the basis of respect for the dignity of all of our citizens, irrespective of their race or religion. Yes, I am happy to say to the Honourable Gentleman that the special relationship we have with the United States is very important, I think, for both the United States and the United Kingdom. We will be continuing to build on that special relationship. That was very clear from the conversation I had with President-elect Trump uh, shortly after his election, to, uh, election as President-elect. Uh, but we, of course, want to ensure the dignity of our citizens. It is up to the United States what rules they put into place in terms of entry across their borders, but we will be ensuring that that special relationship continues and continues in the interests of both the UK and the US. Andrea Jenkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On Tuesday of last week, I attended an Infection Prevention and Control Summit. The summit highlighted the great work done by the Department of Health, the NHS and other organisations to dramatic dramatically decrease MRSA infection rates, yet it also raised the growing threat of E. coli and sepsis. Will my right honourable friend join me in commending events such as these and outline the government's strategy to combating superbugs? 
Well, I will absolutely join my honourable friend in commending events such as that. And she's raised a very important issue, and it's right. The DOH, the Public Health England and NHS are doing vital work to decrease infection rates. We've already seen some very good results. There's 50% redu- 57% reduction in MRSA bloodstream infections since 2010 and a 47% reduction in C. diff infections. But of course there's more to do, and that's why we are setting bold objectives to halve gram-negative blood infections by 2020, and last week announced a new national infection lead to champion and oversee this effort. It's an important issue, and I'm grateful to my honourable friend for raising it. Mr Douglas Carswell. Free trade is absolutely vital to our future prosperity, and Brexit does not mean rejecting globalisation. Will the Prime Minister ensure that any new trade deals with the wider world after Brexit are based on the mutual recognition of standards and not on the kind of overly elaborate, prescriptive, top-down regulatory <coughs> regime that underpins the European single market? Well, first of all, may I welcome the honourable gentleman's support for free trade. He's absolutely right that as we come out of the European Union, we will be looking for those opportunities to develop trading relationships around the world, to develop flexible trading arrange- arrangements around the world, which are the, those that suit the United Kingdom. With the strength of our economy, uh, I believe that we can go out there and really be a global leader in free trade, and I welcome the honourable gentleman's support for that. Chris Phil. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last Wednesday, Seven people tragically died and 50 were injured in a tram accident in Croydon. I'm sure the whole House will join with the Prime Minister, Leader of the Opposition and Leader of the SNP in extending our heartfelt condolences to the bereaved families. There are uh, three investigations underway by British Transport Police, uh, the Office of Road and Rail and the Rail Accident Investigation Board. Can the Prime Minister assure the House and assure the families that any recommendations to improve safety on trams in Croydon and across the country made by those investigations will be rapidly implemented by the Government. Well, once again, I join my honourable friend in expressing our condolences uh, to the families and friends of the seven people who died in this terrible incident and this uh, terrible event that took place, and uh, our sympathies with those who were injured and affected by it, and again, our thanks to the emergency services. It is important that we allow these investigations to continue, that they are able to come up with their recommendations in due course, uh, and we will, of course, look very seriously at those recommendations. We can never be complacent about, uh, about safety and security. Uh, on uh, these sorts of uh, issues. We do need to make sure that if there are lessons to be learned, that they are indeed learned. Closed question. Mr Neil Gray. Number four, please, Mr Speaker. Sorry, uh, Mr... I will get... (laughs) The Government is committed to protecting the most vulnerable in society including disabled people and those with health conditions. And when it comes to people currently receiving employment and support allowance, they will continue to receive the same level of financial support. We are ensuring that the support that is available is being concentrated on those who are most in need. We're also ensuring that support is available, not just in benefits, but in a wider package, to be able to help those who could be able to get into the workplace to reach that point where they are able to get into the workplace. Neil Gray. Mr Speaker, this week the Prime Minister said Uh, There is change in the air, and when people demand change, it is the job of politicians to respond. So how how will she respond to the 70 disability organisations who want these cuts stopped, or to the people on her side who have supported my cross-party motion for debate tomorrow, which calls for these cuts uh, to be halted? Surely she must respond accordingly. As I've, uh, as I've said, what we are doing is focusing support on those most in need. For those in the support group of ESA, uh, their support has gone up. We are giving extra support to those who are in the work-related group who could at some stage get into the workplace to help them to get into the workplace. But it's also important not just to see this as an issue of benefits. It's about the whole package that's available, including the personal independence payments that provide for the living costs of disability. But I, I would just perhaps gently remind the Honourable Gentleman that if he's concerned about the levels of payment in Scotland, then he might wish to talk to the Scottish Government about the new powers, the new powers that they have, uh, and, and, and whether they intend to use those new powers and how they would fund them. Mr Richard Bacon. Mr Speaker, following the election of Mr Trump, 
And given the very welcome progress made in our society, both by women uh, and those from ethnic minorities, uh, what message of reassurance does the Prime Minister have for fat, middle-aged white men who may feel uh, that we have been left behind? <laughs> Um, that, that's a very interesting point. Perhaps my honourable friend would like to come up and see me sometime. <laughs> Lucy Powell. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In their State of the Nation report, her government social mobility commission today issued a damning verdict on progress. Things are getting worse. Mm. They concluded that the key drivers of social mobility, quality in early education, narrowing the educational attainment gap, and access to work and housing are all going backwards under her watch. So when will she come forward with a real strategy for opportunity for all, instead of fixating on creating an even more elite education for those who are already elite? No. Well, I note that the uh, Social Mobility Commission has recorded today that more working class youngsters are benefiting from higher education than at any point in our history. The government's invested record levels in childcare in early years, and the attainment gap, as the report acknowledges, has actually narrowed. But she refers to the education system and to the reintroduction of grammar schools. I would refer her to the report that was commissioned by a Labour council in Knowsley to look at how they could improve educational achievement in Knowsley, and that report said reintroducing grammar schools is potentially a transformative idea for working class areas. Today, the BBC World Service has announced the biggest expansion since the 1940s, including 11 new services in different languages, bringing the total to 40 around the world. Would the Prime Minister agree with me that this is an excellent example of soft power and lifeline to many people around the world? I absolutely agree with my honourable friend. I think that the service that the BBC provides with its world service, the independent journalism that it brings to millions of people around the world, is a very important uh, uh, work that they do, including bringing it to people where often free speech is limited. So it is important that we support them, and that's why we're investing £289 million over the next four years to support their world service, to, uh, as it provides that accurate, that independent news to some of the most remote parts of the world. Stephen Gethin. Mr Speaker, the University of St Andrews in my constituency gets 25% of its research funding from the EU and benefits from freedom of movement that brings some of the finest researchers to St Andrews and elsewhere. What guarantees can she give, in particular after 2020, to research funding and to freedom of movement for academics as well? The, the, the Honourable Gentleman will know that we have already given guarantees in relation to the research funding that uh, is available from the EU and, and uh, those contracts that will be signed. And he will know that we are able already, within the immigration rules that we have for people outside the EU, to ensure that the brightest and the best can come to the United Kingdom. But I also would remind him, as I did his right honourable friend, that it wasn't that long ago that he was campaigning to come out of the European Union and come out of free movement. Johnny Mercer. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In committee yesterday, in committee yesterday, I learned that the Iraq Historical Allegations Team has actually placed uh, members, serving members, and veterans under surveillance in this country. Uh, similarly, I learned that despite everything we've said, we have paid for tax chasing lawyers to go out and collect evidence in theatre. I know of the Prime Minister's commitment to this agenda. Would she agree with me that we need to work harder to close the gap between what we say and how it actually feels for our service men and women? Yeah. Yeah. I, my, my honourable friend raises an important point, and I recognise the concern that has been expressed from a number of honourable friends about the impact the, that the IA ha is having on uh, servicemen and women. I think it is important that we ensure that it conducts its inquiries within a reasonable timescale, which it is now set to do, uh, that, it has we that it weeds out those cases that are, if you like, more frivolous cases. Uh, but I'm sure he would accept with me that where there are uh, allegations of uh, 
credible allegations of criminal activity, that those should be properly investigated. But I am very conscious of the need to ensure that our servicemen and women, who do such a good job for us around the world and in keeping us safe and secure, have the support that they need. Yeah. Close question, Martin Doherty Hughes. Yeah. Mr. Speaker. I recently met the First Minister and leaders of the devolved administrations uh, at the Joint Ministerial Committee. The next meeting of that is planned for early in the new year. And of course, the UK Government engages regularly with the Scottish Government on a whole range of issues. Martin Doherty Hughes. Good on, Mr. Speaker, because I'm sure that there's a question that's vexing not just the First Minister but the whole of Scotland that on the 22nd of June of this year, Ruth Davidson stated to those supporting Leave they won't tell us what they want to replace the single market with. Now that the Prime Minister is part of a government dragging Scotland out of the European Union against its sovereign will, could she answer Ruth Davidson? And on the 23rd of June, the people of the United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union, and that's what this government will deliver. Alberto, oh, the members should not seek to shout down the Prime Minister. The question was asked, and the answer has been provided. Alberto Costa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is right that the Prime Minister has latitude to enter into negotiations with the EU. However, however, the Vote Leave campaign were very clear that the rights of EU citizens would not be affected if this country voted to leave the EU. My parents are Italian. They've never naturalised and they've been in this country for 50 years. Can the Prime Minister assure me that she will never instruct me to vote in a lobby to take away the rights of my parents and millions of EU citizens? I I recognise the personal passion with which my honourable friend raises this issue. I want, intend and expect to be able to guarantee the rights of those EU citizens who are living here in the United Kingdom. But I also want to see the rights of UK citizens living in European Union member states being guaranteed too. As I've said previously, I would hope I would hope that this is an issue uh, on which we can uh, come to uh, a position on which we can discuss with my European colleagues at an early stage. Judith Cummins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Dementia is the single greatest health crisis faced by this country. New figures by the ONS reveal that dementia and Alzheimer's disease are now the leading cause of death. Yet in Bradford, it can take up to four months from referral to diagnosis. Will the Prime Minister today pledge to bring about parity in end-of-life care for people with dementia and, as part of this, commit to introducing a specialist end-of-life service for those diagnosed with Alzheimer's? Well, can I commend the Honourable Lady for raising this issue, and I know that it is a personal concern for her. Um, and it is an issue that affects people across constituencies across this, uh, this House. We have set ourselves an ambitious target of 4 million dementia friends by 2020. We already have 1.6 million of them. We have doubled research spending on dementia and invested in the development of a Dementia Research Institute. But she raises the issue of end-of-life care, and we are determined to transform end-of-life care. That is why we have uh, created the National End-of-Life Care Programme Board. That is going to help implement uh, the commitment to high-quality, personalised end-of-life care for all. She has raised an important issue. I'm grateful to her for raising it, and I'm, I can assure her that this is an issue on which the government is focused. Dr. Julian Lewis. At the same time as the government is rightly restoring hundreds of millions of pounds of funding to the BBC World Service, there are no current plans to restore the very modest £20 million a year it costs to run BBC monitoring. Former members of the Intelligence and Security Committee, such as Lord Ming Campbell and I, are dismayed that the BBC is proposing further to cut the monitoring service, close Caversham Park and break the co-location with its American counterparts. Will the Prime Minister agree to meet us and have a discussion before this disaster is visited on an incomparable source of open source information on which so many government departments and intelligence agencies depend? 
My Honourable Friend does raise an important issue. Of course, uh, the staffing and provision for the monitoring service is a matter for the BBC, but we are very clear of the importance of the uh, service that this provides. <coughs> And it provides high quality reporting for the Foreign Office, for the Ministry of Defence and other parts of government and of course for the BBC itself. What I can tell my honourable friend is that as part of the BBC Charter renewal process we're actually talking with the BBC about a new agreement in relation to the BBC monitoring role um, that we believe will result in an improved service for government, not a reduced one. Lisa Nandy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She doesn't seem to have very much control over world events, but she should at least be able to get a grip on the child abuse inquiry that she set up. In two years, it's lost not only three chairs, but now eight senior lawyers, the latest citing further concerns about competency and leadership. She will be surely as aware as I am that there are further serious allegations that have been made to the inquiry panel that have gone uninvestigated. So can she tell us whether she shares the full confidence in the inquiry that her Home Secretary expressed some moments ago, and if so, why? Well, I recognise the importance of this issue to the Honourable Lady. It's one on which she has campaigned, and she champions the cause of those who are she champions the cause of the victims and survivors, and of course, like her, that is, that it is the victims and survivors that we must always keep at the forefront of our minds. That's why it's important that this inquiry is able to continue, and I agree this point was made this morning by uh, the right honourable, her right honourable friend, the new chairman of the Home Affairs Select Committee. We owe it to the survivors and victims for the inquiry to continue. And I have to say, having seen the work that Professor Alexis Jay has done uh, in the Rotherham inquiry that she Undertook, I have absolute confidence in her ability yeah, yeah, to undertake yeah, this inquiry. Yeah, yeah. Nigel Evans. Uh, during the election in the United States, President, President-elect Trump stated that Britain shouldn't be at the back of any trade queue, but should be at the front yeah. of any trade yeah. queue. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now he is elected president. What action will her government be taking to ensure that the already very good trading conditions between the USA and the United Kingdom further improves? My, my, my honourable friend is absolutely right. Uh, I mentioned earlier, in answer to a previous question, the special relationship between the UK and the USA. I think we now have an opportunity in a trading relationship with the United States of America. That is something on which, at a very early stage, I want to be discussing with President-elect Trump. Malcolm MacDonald. Yeah. Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Mr Speaker, too often social media is the weapon of choice by those who seek to bully and intimidate others. Yeah. It was the weapon... It was the... It was the weapon of choice used against my young constituent, Declan Duncan, when his bullies tried to literally run him out of his own hometown, making his life a misery. Will she agree to meet with Declan and I to discuss how companies like Facebook and Twitter can be held to account for their platforms being too easily used by those trying to harass and bully others? The, the, the Honourable Member raises an important issue. Social media is overall a good that is used for good intents. Um, it's even used by political parties sometimes for uh, their uh, campaigning and other ways. But I have to say to the Honourable Gentleman, and he raises an important point, which is it can also be abused and ill-used by people who wish to bully others. And there are members of this House who have suffered significantly as a result of bullying and trolling on social media. Uh, the Home Office is well appraised of this as an issue, has been over the years, I did with the, when I was Home Secretary, talking to the, the companies about the responsibility that they have in relation to this. I think this is an issue that is best addressed by the terms and conditions of the companies themselves, and I'm sure the Home Secretary has listened very carefully to the point that he's raised. Mr Philip Davis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, in the teeth of opposition from the Conservative Party at the time, the last Labour government changed the law to make sure that all prisoners were released halfway through their sentence, irrespective of whether they would misbehaved in prison or whether they still posed a threat to the public, something which must have contributed to the upsurge in violence in our prisons. Does the Prime Minister agree with the last Labour government that prisoners should be released halfway through the sentence, irrespective of how badly they behave or irrespective of what a threat they pose to the general public, 
or does she agree with me that this is an outrage, flies in the face of public opinion and must be reversed? I think, I think uh, uh, the important point, as my honourable friend uh, indicates, is that when decisions are taken about the release of prisoners, there is proper consideration of the impact that that release will have on the wider community. That's why, that's why uh, this is an issue that has been looked at. I can assure him when I, when I was Home Secretary that this was an issue that was of concern. But it's uh, not just about the conditions under which prisoners are released. It's actually about how we ensure that we have measures in place to rehabilitate ex-offenders, uh, which is why the work that has been done by previous Justice Secretaries and is being continued by the current Justice Secretary is so important to ensure that we reduce reoffending by those prisoners who are released. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can the yeah, yeah. Prime Minister confirm or deny if there have been any official conversations at any level regarding giving Nigel Farage a peerage? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, all I can say to the Honourable Gentleman, I'm afraid, is that such matters are normally never discussed in public. Friend, uh, the Prime Minister, join me in welcoming the announcement of Phase 2 of High Speed 2 from Crewe to Manchester Airport into Manchester Picc Piccadilly, bringing jobs and prosperity to Weaver Vale, to Cheshire, to the North West region, including North Wales, therefore closing the North South Divide. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know my honourable friend has, has championed the cause of HS2 for a long time. I think it's absolutely right. I welcome the announcement, uh, the, the government's announcement on this. It shows we're willing to take the big decisions that actually will help support communities and support our economy, and crucially, as he says, for HS2, support the economy in the part of the, the country that he represents. Albert Owen. Very much, Mr. Speaker. The very special relationship between the UK and the Republic of Ireland has flourished over the years. A major part of that is the port of Holyhead in my constituency, and the reason for it has been free travel, and both have enjoyed that within the European Union that they both joined in 1973. Now the UK has voted to leave the European Union. Can the Prime Minister assure us that there will be no extra barriers in Welsh ports so that that could threaten trade, threaten tourism, and, and threaten that very special relationship. Yeah. The, the, the honourable gentleman refers to the free movement arrangements being in place since 1973. Of course, actually, the common travel area was started 50 years earlier in 1923. So it is for some considerable time before we were in the European Union that that common travel area existed. But I will repeat what I've said in this House before when asked about this issue. We are working with the Repu government of the Republic of Ireland uh, with the Northern Ireland Executive. We're very clear that we don't want to see a return to the borders of the past. We do want to uh, ensure that we uh, and that we recognise the importance that those movements, both of trade and of people, are to both sides of that border. Order. And at almost a uh, quarter to one, Prime Minister's questions finally comes to an end. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn uh, used Boris Johnson's remarks, I think in Czechoslovakia and other places, about the customs union. He was rather more explicit than the government has been so far, so it was a good idea to go on that. Uh, the Prime Minister didn't really answer any of the questions on the customs union. She did say to Angus Robertson, though, that being in or out of the customs union wasn't a binary decision. Um, and I've heard her say that before, but I'm actually not quite sure what that means. It does seem quite binary to me, unless you want to get really complicated and be in the customs union, maybe for aerospace, but not in it for banking or whatever. I have no idea. No doubt. We'll find out as time goes on. Anyway, there's a lot of argy-bargy about we don't, you don't have a plan. We do have a plan. No, you don't. Yes, we do. Um, and do we need more civil servants or don't we? And it went uh, on like that, largely all about the lack of clarity that many people think the government is showing on the way forward on Brexit. And then it finally finished up between the two of them in a sort of party political slanging match of the type that we normally get in the run up to an election.
but I'm sure it wasn't a harbinger of that. <laughs> Certainly not before Christmas mm -hmm. anyway. No, it would be spring. Spring. You mean. Um, actually, a lot of viewers uh, felt, as you have said, that some of the questions were wasted on Brexit negotiations because the Prime Minister isn't saying anything. So John Olsen said, what a waste of opposition questions to continually ask the unanswerable question of what pre-negotiations the final position of Britain will be in relation to the EU. Morwin Dobbs said, leading on Brexit seems increasingly a pointless strategy at this time. Uh, Matthew Mott said, though, an even contest between May and Corbyn this week, with Corbyn being far more hostile than he was typically during his first term, he says, as leader of the opposition, he's upping his game. And Martin Jameson says, is it wrong of me to feel slightly reassured by Jeremy Corbyn's belated return to punch and Judy politics? Squeaky voice in brackets, that's the way to do it. <laughs> Or, didn't do it. I know I didn't. I <laughs> thought about on, doing Joe. the squeaky voice. Go on, Joe. That's the way to do it. I'm not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it certainly was uh, louder uh, than normal. Uh, and he and the speaker mm. had to, what he's always used to do in the past, have to call for some quiet. What did you make of it? Well, I think one of our viewers has actually stolen what, exactly what I was going to say. It was, in a way, a return of Punch and Judy. I mean, mm. Jeremy Corbyn has, you know, certainly seems to have had his Weetabix this morning. He is getting better at doing Prime Minister's questions. And we had a lot more heat than we had light in terms of dragging information out of Theresa May on the government's mm. lack of apparent clear strategy for taking us out of the European Union. But, you know, he was in a quite a feisty mood trying to put pressure on her on what is the biggest issue that the government faces. And as we've discussed on this mm. programme, they don't know what they're going to do yet. The Cabinet does not agree on a well, So they haven't, it's not that they're not telling us, they, that they don't know they, themselves. They don't know. And what we know, you know, this is why the memo story yesterday was interesting, because it underlined what I've had many private conversations about time and again, and what we've discussed on this set too over the recent months, the government is engaged in a huge evidence gathering session. Just one department, the Department for Leaving the Exiting the European Union, is engaged in 51 different sectoral studies of different bits of the economy. That's been sort of replicated across Whitehall. There's a huge scoping exercise. Sounds like the going kind of thing on. Gordon Brown used to do. Well, some people are even suggesting that in terms of this approach. Theresa mm. May, people who've worked closely with her, her, her approach is to get lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of information and then at some point, there will be what somebody described as a, a shimmering diamond of clarity with an idea that might actually work. But of course, if you, do that in, well, what if you do hmm. that in Whitehall, what happens then is officials go off and get information, okay. get more information. But well, the understanding of the principles is not yet there. No, it isn't uh, there. And of course, if you leave a vacuum, of course, uh, others will fill, fill the vacuum, as we've seeing. seen from that's Marmite to Delight. Day after day. To the Institute for Government and that happening will continue all the time. Until the government's ready but to let me more. interrupt you because in Prime Minister's questions, you heard Labour MP Lisa Nandy ask Theresa May about whether she still has confidence in the inquiry into child sex abuse, despite the resignation of another senior lawyer. The independent inquiry has been beset by problems. It's now on to its fourth chairperson. Five legal counsels have already quit. Uh, Lisa Nandy has hot-footed her from the chamber to get in front of our camera and central lobby. Thank you for rushing to the camera, Lisa Nandy. You mentioned uh, that there were other serious accusations doing the rounds. Can you tell us uh, or give us a rough idea of what they are? Well, what I can tell you is that since I started asking Theresa May to get involved in this inquiry, which she set up, and start addressing some of the serious problems that have beset it. I've been approached by a number of people who have been involved or connected to the inquiry who also have real concerns. We've heard some of them emerge into the public domain in recent weeks about bullying, harassment, uh, and also about how public money has been spent on this inquiry. And I think the Prime Minister must surely be aware that there are more allegations to follow and so I was extremely surprised to hear her Home Secretary and then her just now in the House of Commons chamber tell us that she has full confidence in the inquiry without appearing to have the faintest idea why. Or is it your understanding that more resignations could be on the way? I think it is possible that there will be more resignations. If you look at the letter from the latest lawyer to quit the inquiry, she cites concerns about competency and leadership, which is a common theme running through many of these 
resignations and also about the way that past problems have been handled. And this is absolutely critical because if the inquiry doesn't handle what's happened right in the past and make sure that they proceed on a much more transparent, open basis, then survivors will never be able to have confidence that this inquiry will succeed and the inquiry must succeed. Okay, Lisa and Andy, thanks for joining us. Uh, on a serious note, there was another serious note raised at Prime Minister's questions, very serious, this terrible tram accident, fatal uh, accident uh, in Croydon. And I understand in your constituency. Yes, so the, the accident was in my constituency and six of the seven people who tragically lost their lives are my constituents. So it's been a, it's been a very difficult last week. Um, it was good to hear both the Prime Minister and, and the Leader of the Opposition uh, offer their condolences and we're expecting later this afternoon an interim report from the Rail Accident Investigation Branch. On the points Lisa and Andy raise on the entirely different issue of this inquiry, it's kind of hard to avoid the impression it's a real mess. It absolutely is, and I think credit to Lisa for constantly highlighting these issues. I do think it's something that perhaps the government has to get a bit of a grip on here because it is very serious and, you know, the allegations that have been made and the concerns that have been raised actually... Um, we need to have confidence that if this inquiry is taking place, that uh, not only will its findings be uh, correct and proper, uh, but also the, the victims and the families will have some form of redress, some form of closure mm. on a but terrible... But narrow the so. remit? Is that, is that the way forward, to try and reduce the scope for the inquiry? Well, I think that is part of the problem. The scope is just so wide, and uh, it may well be that that has to be uh, one of the ways forward. But we have to have confidence in whatever is done but in this inquiry. We're now on to the fourth mm. chairperson, yes. uh, someone clearly competent, because they, they mm. did the... Uh, highly regarded study into, I think, Rochdale or Rotherham? Rotherham. 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 Uh, Rotherham. Very well respected that. social workers. But we all yeah. thought part of the problem was it's mm -hmm. difficult for any chairperson to get a grip of mm -hmm. things because it was so wide-ranging. Mm -hmm. But the problem seemed to be much uh, more bizarre than that. It's about harassment, about bullying, about Leadership. inappropriate behaviour. Yes, there seems to be a whole tangle of mess inside the inquiry itself, not just the fact that it was instituted with this enormous remit. And they've already looked at that again. One of the things that Alexis Jay has done is said that they will look at things in a thematic way, so they have already slightly changed the scope, not narrowed it, but sort of altered it. But that can be causing the bullying or the harassment. And, or... and this suggests that there's a real dysfunctionality right at the centre yes. of the inquiry. And under Lowell Goddard, certainly the suggestion is that when she was in charge, there was a situation it... that some people found... Intolerable. It was out of control. It was out of control. Of course, the Home Affairs Select Committee under Yvette Cooper mm. are trying to look at that. They've called Lowell Goddard to come and give mm. give evidence to them, and she's sort of so far refusing. But she's gone back moment. to New Zealand. But it does, it does seem in, extraordinary that an inquiry that was set up to sort of right wrongs is unable to control mm. its own wrongs. And of course, politically, it matters not just because it's, it matters so much to the victims of things that have happened over years gone by, but because this was Theresa May's inquiry. Indeed, she set she it up. She brought this in as Home Secretary. Oh. She has defended it. Yes, it is independent, but it's something that began on her watch as Home Secretary and now as Prime Minister she'll have to okay. get it under control. The point I was going to make to you before we went to PMQs, but we haven't got time mm. to talk on it, was just that the Trump people mm. at the weekend told me that Trump was minded actively to help Britain in the Brexit negotiations, mm. to put pressure on the Europeans to help where he could, mm. which is interesting. And we'll see very, very different from Mr. Obama being at the back of the queue. Absolutely. Interesting, the, though, nobody congratulated or welcomed his election. No, though they just raised it. They did. And quite often they're myopic. At least they raised another country today. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Laura. I'm a bit, a bit, a bit, that's all, folks.